The French Second Republic was a short-lived Republican government of France under President Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. It lasted from the 1848 Revolution to the 1851 coup by which the President made himself Emperor Napoleon III and initiated the Second Empire. It officially adopted the motto of the First Republic, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité. The Second Republic witnessed the tension between the «Social and Democratic Republic» French, La République démocratique et sociale and a liberal form of republicanism, which exploded during the June Days Uprising of 1848. History Revolution of 1848 The 1848 Revolution in France, sometimes known as the February Revolution, was one of a wave of revolutions across Europe in that year. The event swept away the Orleans Monarchy 1830 and led to the creation of the nation's Second Republic. The industrial population of the Faubourgs was welcomed by the National Guard on their way towards the centre of Paris. Barricades were raised after the shooting of protesters outside the Guizot Manor by soldiers. On 23 February 1848 Prime Minister François Guizot's cabinet resigned, abandoned by the petite bourgeoisie, on whose support they thought they could depend. The heads of the left centre and the dynastic left, Louis Mathieu Molay and Adolphe Thiers, declined the offered leadership. Odilon Barreau accepted it, and Thomas Robert Bugo, commander-in-chief of the 1st Military Division, who had begun to attack the barricades, was recalled. In the face of the insurrection that had now taken possession of the whole capital, King Louis-Philippe abdicated in favor of his grandson, Prince Philippe, Count of Paris claimed by Alphonse de Lamartine in the name of the provisional government elected by the chamber under the pressure of the mob. This provisional government with Dupont de Lure as its president, consisted of Lamartine for foreign affairs, Cremieux for justice, Ledru Roland for the interior, Carnot for public instruction, Gaucho for finance, Arago for the navy, and Bordeaux for war. Garnier Pages was mayor of Paris. But, as in 1830, the Republican Socialist Party had set up a rival government at the Hôtel de Ville City Hall, including Louis Blanc, Armand Marast, Ferdinand Flocon, and Alexander Martin, known as Albert Louvrier, Albert the Worker, which bid fair to involve discord and civil war. But this time the Palais Bourbon was not victorious over the Hôtel de Ville. It had to consent to a fusion of the two bodies, in which, however, the predominating elements were the moderate Republicans. It was uncertain what the policy of the new government would be. One party seeing that in spite of the changes in the last 60 years of all political institutions the position of the people had not been improved, demanded a reform of society itself, the abolition of the privileged position of property, which they viewed as the only obstacle to equality, and as an emblem hoisted the red flag the 1791 red flag was, however, the symbol not merely of the French Revolution, but rather of martial law and of order. The other party wished to maintain society on the basis of its traditional institutions, and rallied round the tricolore. As a concession made by Lamartine to popular aspirations, and in exchange of the maintaining of the tricolor flag, he conceded the Republican triptych of Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, written on the flag, on which a red rosette was also to be added. The first collision took place as to the form which the 1848 revolution was to take. Lamartine wished for them to maintain their original principles, with the whole country as supreme, whereas the revolutionaries under Ledru Roland wished for the Republic of Paris to hold a monopoly on political power. On 5 March the government, under the pressure of the Parisian clubs, decided in favour of an immediate reference to the people, and direct universal suffrage, and adjourned it until 26 April. This added the uneducated masses to the electorate and led to the election of the Constituent Assembly of 4 May 1848. The provisional government having resigned, the Republican and anti-socialist majority on 9 May entrusted the supreme power to an executive commission consisting of five members, Arago, Pierre-Marie de Saint-Georges, Garnier Pages, Lamartine and Ledru Roland. The result of the general election, the return of a constituent assembly, predominantly moderate, if not monarchical, dashed the hopes of those who had looked for the establishment, by a peaceful revolution, of their ideal socialist state, but they were not prepared to yield without a struggle, and in Paris itself they commanded a formidable force. In spite of the preponderance of the tricolor 
Party in the Provisional Government, so long as the voice of France had not spoken, the socialists, supported by the Parisian proletariat, had exercised an influence on policy disproportionate to their relative numbers. By the decree of 24 February, the Provisional Government had solemnly accepted the principle of the right to work and decided to establish national workshops. For the unemployed, at the same time, a sort of industrial parliament was established at the Luxembourg Palace, under the presidency of Louis Blanc, with the object of preparing a scheme for the organization of labor, and, lastly, by the decree of 8 March, the property qualification for enrollment in the National Guard had been abolished and the workmen were supplied with arms. The socialists thus formed a sort of state within a state, complete with a government and an armed force. On 15 May, an armed mob, headed by Raspail, Blanqui and Barbes, and assisted by the proletariat-aligned guard, attempted to overwhelm the assembly, but were defeated by the bourgeois-aligned battalions of the National Guard. Meanwhile, the national workshops were unable to provide remunerative work for the genuine unemployed, and of the thousands who applied, the greater number were employed in aimless digging and refilling of trenches. Soon even this expedient failed, and those for whom work could not be invented were given a half-wage of one franc a day. Even this pitiful dole, with no obligation to work, proved attractive, and all over France, workmen quit their jobs and travelled to Paris, where they swelled the ranks of the army under the red flag. The socialist economic plan was straining state finances, and as the emute of 15 May had proven that it constituted a perpetual menace to the state, the government decided to end it. On 21 June, Alfred de Falu decided in the name of the Parliamentary Commission on Labour that the workmen should be discharged within three days and those who were able-bodied should be forced to enlist. After this, the June Days Uprising broke out, over the course of 24–26 June, when the Eastern Industrial Quarter of Paris, led by Pujol, fought the Western Quarter, led by Louis Eugene Cavignac, who had been appointed dictator. The Socialist Party was defeated and afterwards its members were deported. But the Republic had been discredited and had already become unpopular with both the peasants, who were exasperated by the new land tax of 45 centimes imposed in order to fill the empty treasury, and with the bourgeoisie, who were intimidated by the power of the revolutionary clubs and disadvantaged by the economic stagnation. By the massacres of the June days, the working classes were also alienated from it. The Duke of Wellington wrote at this time, France needs a Napoleon. I cannot yet see him. The granting of universal suffrage to a society with imperialist sympathies would benefit reactionaries, which culminated in the election of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte as President of the Republic. Constitution The new constitution, proclaiming a democratic republic, direct universal suffrage and the separation of powers, was promulgated on 4 November. Under the new constitution, there was to be a single permanent assembly of 750 members elected for a term of three years by the scrutin de liste. The assembly would elect members of a council of state to serve for six years. Laws would be proposed by the council of state, to be voted on by the assembly. The executive power was delegated to the president, who was elected for four years by direct universal suffrage, i.e. on a broader basis than that of the assembly, and was not eligible for re-election. He was to choose his ministers, who, like him, would be responsible to the assembly. Finally, revision of the constitution was made practically impossible, it involved obtaining three times in succession a majority of three quarters of the deputies in a special assembly. It was in vain that Jules Gravy, in the name of those who perceived the obvious and inevitable risk of creating, under the name of a president, a monarch and more than a king, proposed that the head of the state should be no more than a removable president of the ministerial council. Lamartine, thinking that he was sure to be the choice of the electors under universal suffrage, won over the support of the chamber, which did not even take the precaution of rendering ineligible the members of families which had reigned over France. It made the presidency and office dependent upon popular acclamation. The presidential election of 1848 The election was keenly contested, the Democratic Republicans adopted as their candidate Ledru Roland, the «Pure Republicans» Cavignac, and the recently reorganized imperialist party Prince Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. 
Unknown in 1835, and forgotten or despised since 1840, Louis Napoleon had in the last eight years advanced sufficiently in the public estimation to be elected to the Constituent Assembly in 1848 by five departments. He owed this rapid increase of popularity partly to blunders of the government of July, which had unwisely aroused the memory of the country, filled as it was with recollections of the empire, and partly to Louis Napoleon's campaign carried on from his prison at Ham by means of pamphlets of socialistic tendencies. Moreover, the monarchists, led by Thiers and the Committee of the Rue de Poitiers, were no longer content even with the safe dictatorship of the upright Cavignac, and joined forces with the Bonapartists. On 10 December the peasants gave over five million votes to a name, Napoleon, which stood for order at all costs, against 1,400,000 for Cavignac. Henri-Georges Boulet de la Meurthe was elected vice-president, a unique position in French history. The presidency of Louis Napoleon For three years, there was an indecisive struggle between the heterogeneous assembly and the president, who was silently awaiting his opportunity. He chose as his ministers men with little inclination towards republicanism, with a preference for Orléanists, the chief of whom was Odilon Barreau. In order to strengthen his position, he endeavoured to conciliate the reactionary parties, without committing himself to any of them. The chief instance of this was the expedition to Rome voted by the Catholics, to restore the temporal authority of the Pope Pius IX, who had fled Rome in fear of the Nationalists and Republicans. Garibaldi and Mazzini had been elected to a constitutional assembly, the Pope called for international intervention to restore him in his temporal power. The French president moved to establish the power and prestige of France against that of Austria, as beginning the work of European renovation and reconstruction which he already looked upon as his mission. French troops under Oudinot marched into Rome. This provoked a foolish insurrection in Paris in favour of the Roman Republic, that of the Château d'Eau, which was crushed on 13 June 1849. On the other hand, when the Pope, though only just restored, began to yield to the general movement of reaction, the President demanded that he should set up a liberal government. The Pope's dilatory reply having been accepted by the French ministry, the President replaced it on 1 November, by the Fold Ruhr cabinet. This looked like a declaration of war against the Catholic and monarchist majority in the Legislative Assembly, which had been elected on 28 May in a moment of panic. But the President again pretended to be playing the game of the Orléanists, as he had done in the case of the Constituent Assembly. The complementary elections of March and April 1850 resulted in an unexpected victory for the Republicans which alarmed the conservative leaders, Thiers, Barrier and Montalembert. The President and the Assembly co-operated in the passage of the LOI Fallu of 15 March 1850, which again placed university instruction under the direction of the Church. A conservative electoral law was passed on 31 May. It required each voter to prove three years' residence at his current address, by entries in the record of direct taxes. This effectively repealed universal suffrage. Factory workers, who moved fairly often, were thus disenfranchised. The law of 16 July aggravated the severity of the press restrictions by re establishing the caution money deposited by proprietors and editors of papers with the government as a guarantee of good behavior. Finally, a skillful interpretation of the law on clubs and political societies suppressed about this time all the republican societies. It was now their turn to be crushed like the socialists. Topic <coughs> coup. <coughs> However, the president had only joined in Montalembert's cry of "Down with the republicans." in the hope of effecting a revision of the constitution without having recourse to a coup d'état. His concessions only increased the boldness of the monarchists, while they had only accepted Louis Napoleon as president in opposition to the republic and as a step in the direction of the monarchy. A conflict was now inevitable between his personal policy and the majority of the chamber, who were moreover divided into legitimists and Orléanists, in spite of the death of Louis Philippe in August 1850. Louis Napoleon exploited their projects for a restoration of the monarchy, which he knew to be unpopular in the country, and which gave him the opportunity of furthering his own personal ambitions. From 8 August to 12 November 1850 he went about France stating the case for a revision of the constitution in speeches which he varied according to each place, he held reviews, at which cries of, Vive Napoleon! 
showed that the army was with him. He superseded General Changarnier, on whose arms the parliament relied for the projected monarchical coup d'état. He replaced his Orleanist ministry by obscure men devoted to his own cause, such as Morny, Fleury, and Persigny, and gathered round him officers of the African army, broken men like General Saint Arnaud. In fact, he practically declared open war. His reply to the votes of censure passed by the Assembly, and their refusal to increase his civil list was to hint at a vast communistic plot in order to scare the bourgeoisie, and to denounce the electoral law of 31 May 1850, in order to gain the support of the mass of the people. The Assembly retaliated by throwing out the proposal for a partial reform of that article of the Constitution which prohibited the re-election of the President and the re-establishment of universal suffrage July. All hope of a peaceful issue was at an end. When the questers called upon the chamber to have posted up in all barracks the decree of 6 May 1848 concerning the right of the assembly to demand the support of the troops if attacked, the Mountain, dreading a restoration of the monarchy, voted with the Bonapartists against the measure, thus disarming the legislative power. Louis Napoleon saw his opportunity, and organized the French coup of 1851. On the night of 1 half December 1851, the anniversary of his uncle Napoleon's coronation in 1804 and his victory at Austerlitz in 1805, he dissolved the chamber, re-established universal suffrage, had all the party leaders arrested, and summoned a new assembly to prolong his term of office for ten years. The deputies who had met under barrier at the Mary of the Tenth Arrondissement to defend the constitution and proclaim the deposition of Louis Napoleon were scattered by the troops at Mazes and mont Valerian. The resistance organized by the Republicans within Paris under Victor Hugo was soon subdued by the intoxicated soldiers. The more serious resistance in the département was crushed by declaring a state of siege and by the «mixed commissions». Quote, the plebiscite of 20 December, ratified by a huge majority the coup d'état in favor of the prince-president, who alone reaped the benefit of the excesses of the Republicans and the reactionary passions of the monarchists. 